in our series of fireside chats here at um, the Jewish Community Center. Here at the Jewish Community <coughs> um, We're very pleased and proud to have with us tonight uh, several former fireside chattees. There's Vivian, there's Jack, anybody else? That's a couple. And we've got a nice big crowd this evening um, for somebody who, as we look at the community and the way it's changed in the last few years, there's Jack, who, who came in the early 60s, there's Vivian, who was here even before that. And now the camera shifts a little forward. Um, Eric came here in 19, what does it say here? 63. 63. BC. 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 Before, before Coral. Yeah. <laughs> it, just, it just looks like he came in 63 BC, but he's actually quite a young man for his age. You have um, tonight another in our, we're very lucky in the community to have a range of people who uh, work well at bringing the best stories out and sitting quietly on those that perhaps we don't need to hear. Um, talking to Eric tonight will be Clive Grossman, who's been here 23 years. Clive arrived in the 80s, uh, around the same time as I did. Um, tonight, the Jewish Historical Society, for those of you who don't know anything about the society, we do three or four different things. Um, there's the library that's around the corner here that Brenda runs most admirably, <coughs> which has one of the best connect collections of uh, Asian Judaica. Uh, in the region. Um, we work, uh, Howard's work works very hard on the cemetery uh, as well as being an ace video operator and uh, we carry out a lot of um, other functions. We have publications and you'll have seen outside tonight some of our publications including um, the book of the restoration of the shul. Um, we commend those publications to you. Uh, there's more in them than meets the eye they're all learned, they're all well researched, and they carry with, when you leave here, a little bit of the Jewish Historical Society with you. So <coughs> I can't uh, urge you strongly enough, if you haven't already got our shul book, or any of the monographs about Jews in Asia, please try and pick one up on your way out. Um, they're not expensive. Uh, Clive will be uh, helping us uh, to hear from Eric this evening. We're pleased to have his friends and family here too. Uh, there will be a period for questions towards the end. Uh, we have a mic if you need it, but um, most of us don't. Uh, please bear with us as we try and get the sound balance for these two chaps, and um, I'd like you to join me in just saying good evening and welcome to Clive. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Eric's already been introduced to you. I, not much I can, I'm going to tell you about him because uh, he's only got a, an hour to tell you about that himself, and that should get him to about the time he went to school, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's well known to most of you here. He's been a, a central pillar of the community for very many years. If you look over there behind him, there's his a small part of his family tree. There's about 300 people on that uh, list there. But we're not going to go through all of them tonight. <laughs> uh, Eric's got a philosophy of life, and it's this. Nothing ever happens haphazardly. And as he goes through his story this evening, I think you'll find out why that is his philosophy. Eric. Uh, Eric. Uh, your, your background is, I think, or your family background is essentially from Lithuania. Correct. Would you like to tell us a bit about that? Yes. Uh, the family came from Lithuania in 1882. They came to, uh, first up was Manchester, where uh, my grandfather's eldest sister had a garment mill. Her name was Tetsubasa, and uh, she's supposed to be the lady who invented the, the midi blouse. Uh, her husband had a walking stick factory, and my grandfather, who was an engineer and an inventor, uh, family legend has it uh, invented uh, by a steam process the bend in the walking stick. Uh, he also was a matzo baker and he, he married, he, to the disgust of his sister, I think she fired him, he fell in love with a machinist, uh, Shana Rose, uh, Zeiniger, uh, and uh, they got married in Manchester in uh, 1894 
and must have embarked about 1896 for South Africa on uh, what, either the Union Line or the Castle Line. Eventually they merged, uh, cost 10 pounds a head. Along with her probably came her, three, her two sisters, Esther and, um, and Leah. Esther married uh, Mona Shapiro, Leah married uh, Joe Bergstein, the Shapiro line has produced just recently the first uh, South African born mm -hmm. chief rabbi in South Africa, Warren Goldstein. The Beer side uh, and the Shapiro and the Bergstein side have been very, very close. Uh, just in our family, uh, we, my grandfather has uh, produced 300 descendants mm -hmm. so far. They're all featured on the tree here. Mm -hmm. And Coral and I know most of them and are in touch through the year with, with uh, many of them. Eric, can we go uh, forward now to, to, to you? You were born in what year? I was born uh, 30 years after gold was discovered in Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the copies, a copy is a rocky outcrop on, on the mountain in Hillbrow. Uh, in 1929, a year after Mickey Mouse was born, and the same year the Model T was launched. It was also the year of the Great Crash. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, we moved to Durban. Yes. It was my father, a travelling salesman, who was very uh, careful with his money, except when it came to buying cameras. He used to uh, get a per diem allowance, and he would uh, then, with his primus stove in the back of his car, pull up <coughs> under a bridge and sleep that night under the bridge and uh, save the money that he got uh, for the per diem allowance. He moved to Durban in 1929, shortly after I was born. I was one of three. My sister Hilda, a remarkable woman, was eight years older than me. Uh, and Edna was uh, five years older than me, four years older than me. Unfortunately, she passed away at nine. She was epileptic. And, uh, and, uh, and so just Hilda and I continued. Hilda was at a boarding school, a very good swimmer, and a remarkable lady who, up until her 80th year of age was still body surfing off Laguna Beach and was in the papers once a year <laughs> as she came up the beach in pretty good shape. Unfortunately, she passed away about two years ago. Eric, what was it like growing up in South Africa as a young Jewish boy? Well, I, my earliest memory of going to shul was with my father and uh, we sat in the back corner and I was very embarrassed because inside his sedua he was reading miniature editions of Shakespeare. I was sure the rabbi was going to find us out. So I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I went through the usual batch of uh, nursery schools, but I had no Jewish education. Although I went to boarding school at six and stayed there till I was 12, it was a very posh boarding school. Uh, I used to talk with uh, almost a bit better than Coral um, uh But I knew that being Jewish, I mustn't eat bacon. So all those years, I, I didn't bacon. I, I wouldn't have known what ham was. I suppose I was tricked into that. But I was not a happy boy. I was the only Jewish boy in that school. And my sister was the only Jewish girl in a convent. She had no problem. She thoroughly enjoyed it. I frankly was miserable. We had to report every morning whether we were positive or negative as far as motions were concerned. <laughs> I must have been reporting I was negative for about three years just to get my father's attention. My mother and father were divorced when I was five, separated when I was five. And uh, I was not a very happy child, and, and I was a pretty complex child. And I don't know if any of you, maybe you do, Jack, remember Al Farfa. He was the fellow with a piece of hair that went up like that in, in, the, in the movies in those days. I felt that I looked like Al Farfa. And I had a poor self-image for most of my uh, young, young years. But Eric, uh, nevertheless, is a uh, as a young man, though, I think you played a uh, very good standard of rugby and, uh, and provincial swimming. Yes. Uh, my mother lived in Johannesburg. My father got custody of the two of us, and he was our hero. Mm -hmm. um, a special, uh, and a fellow who at 80 gave up riding his motorbike because uh, he had to wear a helmet. <laughs> and uh, just on that subject, while I'm talking about age, when I was about uh, 45 or so, I asked Dad, Dad, what's it like to get old? He says, it gets better decade by decade, and you never want to go back. Mm -hmm. I was telling the story recently at Vision 2047 Breakfast, which Robert Dorfman is the chairman of, and Henry Steiner asked me how I spelled decade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, 
dad had a, a custody and he, he really looked after us. He was very good with kids who were not yet teenagers and couldn't talk back. And he certainly was my hero, an ex uh, town mounted rifle uh, soldier. He was in southwest Africa with uh, young smuts. And uh, eventually he left for America, left me in boarding school. And uh, I did have a bar mitzvah. I think I went for 18 months. I was very conscious about being the only Jew and going for to boarding school, going to Hebrew lessons. I wasn't very good. The Hebrew teacher, David Harris, said to me, talk to you, talk to the vault, talk to the cat. And I had the same problem with the trots when I came to Hong Kong and tried to learn Cantonese. It's, it also goes like this. Uh, Eric, um, you, I think you, you got married quite young. Yes. At 22, having all the answers in the world as a 22-year-old does, I married a 17-year-old, very good-looking lady, always had very good taste in wives. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> our wedding waltz was, um, they told us we were too young, and uh, they happened to be right. Our marriage lasted seven years, produced three very fine children, and unfortunately, um, I did to my children what uh, I'd sworn I never would do because I was very conscious of my parents having separated, but it eventually happened with me as well. And uh, how, how, how many years were you married? I married seven years, and, and after that I met uh, Coral. Um, in fact, she had a, a boyfriend, a very charming fellow who played a great game of tennis. Uh, and I went into the office one day and talked to our Burroughs machinist and also a French uh, Russian, her, 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 she was the sister of him, and I said to her, I hear that uh, your brother's got a very nice uh, girlfriend called Coral Vincent. And she said, yes, would you like to meet her? And I said, no, I can't meet her, she's your brother's boyfriend. She said, no, don't worry, don't worry. And she gave Coral a call, and Coral walked into my office to be introduced, and she, as she described it, I, I rose up from behind the desk and kept going up, and the first thing I could think to say to her was, what beautiful teeth you have. <laughs> <laughs> I then talked to her into letting me take her down to Mutton Kumas, down the south coast, where she ran a, a ballet school. She was a beautiful ballet dancer, eventually a modern dancer. And I will say this, as we walked down the lane, towards my car, she was walking like a duck. I never gave her the years to cure her. <laughs> <laughs> but you, when you came to Hong Kong, I think you came without Coral. Yes. My mother and Coral got on extremely well. Yeah. My mother had said to me uh, at the time of the divorce, you know, how could you do this to me? And uh, although she got on very well with Coral, she did not want me to marry uh, out. Uh, my sister had married out and uh, to a fellow who looked very Jewish. <laughs> Coral didn't look Jewish. <laughs> and doesn't, anyway. Um, so when I left South Africa, leaving three children behind, um, my problem in South Africa was that I was Aaron Beer's nephew. Aaron Beer, who's featured in the picture here, was a great influence on my life and is still my mentor. And. Uh, in that furniture business, Beer Brothers, uh, about six or seven nephews were working as well, and I was uh, the least effective of all the nephews. And it so happened that I, I had to had no choice but to resign from the Beer Group, joined a group in, in Johannesburg, and that came unstuck. And so I had no choice, being Aaron Beer's nephew, to get back into the furniture business, the only trade that I knew. I'd been in it for about 15 years friend said, why don't you uh, go to Hong Kong? If you do, I will support you. And so I found myself with no choice but to leave South Africa, leave the children. My ex-wife, Fanny, was about to get married. And uh, so I left. And I said goodbye to Coral because she wasn't Jewish. And at that time, uh, it was really just not the thing to do. I'll tell you this, that in our family there was one divorce in 1940, my father's, another one of an uncle in 1946, and I was the third divorce. And my cousin Jonathan Beer, who was today quite a philanthropist in South Africa, refused to go to school the next day because he was so ashamed to have somebody in the family who was divorced. It was a bad time. Uh, I set quite an example because after that, my cousin started to go down like dominoes. <laughs> 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 I 
would seem to be a fashion today, and I'm happy to have been a pioneer. <laughs> Worked out well. So I said goodbye to Carol, and, uh, and I left, and uh, she wrote to me continually, asking me what I thought of this fellow she was going out with and that fellow she was going out with, and, uh, and I'll just skip a bit of my first impressions in Hong Kong that I know you want to hear about, because you know she did eventually join me, I presume you tumbled to that fact. <laughs> you look like an intelligent <laughs> So I wrote a letter to a fellow called Bob Belsky in New York, and one of these blue letter cards that you used to fold up, you know, cost 50 cents. There we go, right. And, um, and I was lonely. I, uh, so I wrote a letter to Coral, too, uh, telling her that she should come. I'd come out with a thousand pounds, which was the South African allowance at that time, which was a third of my capital. Uh, and of course, I was also supporting the children and an ex-wife in, in South Africa, but I got off lucky. We had a very civilized divorce in South Africa, very, very fortunate. And, um, and I wrote a letter to Coral, which I had no intention to mail, just so I put my thoughts down on what she should do and pick up a thousand pounds. I mean, there was a good reason to write a letter for a thousand pounds. And I went down and mailed the letter on the corner of Ice House Street in Queen Joy. There used to be a Queen, a Royal, a royal Red uh, mailbox there. And I mailed the letter to Bob Felsky and I walked left along uh, Queen's Road over Duddle Street, looked in my hand and I still had the letter to Bob Belsky, which I rushed back to the post box and my arm wouldn't got in, but it wouldn't go down. So that's part of my philosophy that uh, nothing happens haphazardly. The quarrel came out uh, in February of 1964. What, what were you doing in Hong Kong at that time? I had one introduction, two introductions here, one to David Bergen, who was a trustee, as it happened, of the community, and a lawyer, and another to a fellow called Edmund Yip, who was a, in an export and import business in Chungking Mansions, which in 1963 was a new building. <laughs> and um, so I, I went with Edmund Yip, and uh, I started to bring in South African orange juice, I also had the option from OK Bazaar South Africa, which was a huge enterprise at that time, to bring in pot of gold and a beautiful white label. And nobody would look at it because white is a mourning color in Hong Kong, so OK Bazaars wouldn't change their label, so I was out of the import business. Um, Edmund uh, and, and I broke up uh, fairly soon afterwards, and uh, I had no choice then but to open an export business, which certainly wasn't my intention. Eric, so Coral came out, uh, <coughs> did you get married? I still wasn't sure. She had a return ticket, so it seemed fair. Uh, we had the thousand pounds that helped. <laughs> uh, the return ticket had a value, but for all that, I still felt that marrying out wasn't the right uh, thing to do. David Bergen and a cousin, Brenda, in Durban, uh, they talked me into the fact that I was being stupid. So in August of 64, uh, we got married at the city hall by a Chinese registrar. And, uh, and uh, we lived happily ever after, except uh, about 28 years down the line. And we'll get to that a little later, perhaps. <laughs> now, uh, tell, tell us, what was Hong Kong like in the 60s for those who weren't on the floor? put on your uh, imagination, I want you to imagine the center of Hong Kong. Uh, the two tallest buildings there were the Hong, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank and the China Bank <coughs> building. Uh, the Hilton had just been built, opened in December 1962. The Mandarin Hotel was a building, as was Prince's Buildings. There was ample car parking space in front of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, where Stanley Square is today. Uh, the city hall was up and the, the Star Ferry was where it is today. However, the, uh, the water, the sea line was just over uh, the Mandarin Road, Connaught Road, and went all the way down to Shockey Wan. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong Club, of course, was there. And um, otherwise, it was a flat city. Uh, and funnily enough, they used to have uh, property auctions at the city hall. Edmund Yip and Gordon Wu of Hopewell and uh, a fellow called, I think his name was William Kwan, who's today in the Canada, an auditor, a big auditing company. Uh, we were all pally. There was no tunnel. Edmund had a, 
a Jaguar on that side and he had a Jaguar on this side. Uh, flag Ford in Hong Kong was $1.50 and on Calvin's side it was $1 in the taxis. And uh, it, uh, we used to go out, Edmund used to take uh, the four of us out, two Chinese buddies and two Chinese buddies and me, and we'd go to the Oriental Ballroom. The Oriental Ballroom was in Tonicky Road. There was a menu of girls there. I seem to remember one that uh, I met, number 18, I think it was, called Ping Ping something or other. <laughs> she wasn't Jewish either. BC. <laughs> <laughs> that was before Carl arrived. And, and uh, we went out on the bay in his boat, in Edmund's boat, and uh, went to Picnic Bay in Lama. And I remember first getting up on the skis there, together with Gordon Wu and falling when I came off immediately into a or whatever you call them, of jellyfish. So it was a painful first lesson. Uh, and as far as uh, the rest of the center of Hong Kong, of course, nobody, I was paying $600 a month in, uh, in the church guest house. That's where I stayed at first. Mm -hmm. Reverend Frank Rowe, you may remember, he leased it to me on behalf of the Archbishop. And I remember an night when he was talking <laughs> conversion to me, and I was Let's listening very carefully. Thank you very much. Very, very nice. Were you, were you involved at all with the Jewish community then? No, not at all. I, uh, but I must have, through David, Ber David and Rocky Bourbon, who were very good friends, I uh, must have come to the Jewish Recreation Club. Yeah. Um, and then Coral arrived. And I'll say this, that uh, for all the years of our marriage, Coral always came to shul. <coughs> um, after 28 years of marriage, uh, it happened that uh, I went to shul one evening. Some of you will remember Max Shapiro, who was the high holiday chazan here in uh, 1889, I think, to 92. And I went with him to shul. You know, he was your cousin, was he? My cousin, yeah. He was your cousins, too. And it's maybe in the front row here, we have four people who were on that tree. My daughter, Nicole, who's uh, a little older than she used to be. <laughs> and uh, Jonathan Pinkin, who's come now to live in Hong Kong. Anyway, I went that's to Shul. That's two. <coughs> three. Who's the fourth? I'm the fourth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carry on. I went to Shul on this uh, Rosh Hashanah night. It was the it was not the first night of Rosh Hashanah. The, 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 the it wasn't the air of Rosh Hashanah. It was the first night of Rosh Hashanah. But was Max was staying with us, he um, had to go upstairs to Judy Diesel to eat because we weren't kosher. And uh, so I went with him just to keep him company, he walked into the shul. At the time I was the chairman of the Jewish community. And there was Rabbi Benzion Lapian, who had just come here, sitting dazed in, the, in his chair. There was no minion. So I went out to find the, uh, the uh, Darwish group who, who prayed in the uh, house, mm -hmm. the headmaster's house. Uh, yeah, and uh, brought them in. Now we had the, we had the minion. And I, now picture our shul, and on the seaside we were all sitting there, and Benzion Lapian got up there and he said, if there's a spark of Judaism in, in you, I can be the bellows. He said something after that I can't remember, and I suddenly got weepy. Lithuanians, incidentally, are very weepy people. <laughs> and um, I went to the other side of the dimmer, and I cried my eyes out. See, I'm going to go. <coughs> well, can we can then go back a bit? You told us how you never mixed with the Jewish community, yet, and now you're in the synagogue. How did you get involved in the Jewish community? Uh, I, that's right. Rob Dorfman, who was chairman of the Jewish community in the late 80s, asked me to come aboard the committee. And um, I, had, I had no portfolio. I just had to, I was asked to give him advice. We went through quite a stormy time on that committee because there was the question of the shul and was it going to survive. There was a denotice issued against it, which you've heard about and you'll read about along the corridor here. Ten million was, was needed to fix the uh, to fix the bank there, which was collapsing. The whole of mid levels was frozen as far as the building was concerned because there'd been a big uh, landslide in Beauchamp in 1972. It feels like yesterday, but it's, it's a long time ago. And um, on that committee, uh, we, we discussed such things as uh, 
as, as the, what was going to happen with the shoe, Rina Zion was the one person on the committee who told us that uh, we were thinking incorrectly, that we shouldn't uh, consider uh, having the shoe knocked down. She said the shoe is our home. We thought she was a nutcase. <laughs> Today I understand fully what she meant. And also on that committee, uh, we had uh, an incident happen. You may, some of you may wonder, how did the reform shoe come to Hong Kong? Chuck Manat was on that committee, and there was an unfortunate uh, incident with uh, the rabbi of the time who was uh, training a young uh, green boy for his bar mitzvah. Bob Green's son. Bob Green's son. And I've just forgotten Bob's wife's name. Great, great, great. 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 <laughs> and um, so just a few weeks before the bar mitzvah, he advised them that because Grace wasn't an uh, Orthodox converted, he wouldn't be able to uh, have the boy have his bar mitzvah in the shul. This caused a real rupus, ruckus. And um, the trustees brought a, a reform rabbi in from uh, Australia and conducted the ceremony. Um, Chuck was agitating for us to change our ways and uh, not have this incident like this happen again. And we, we couldn't change the situation. Mortified by what had happened, and he persisted, and eventually he, Bob Green, and uh, Bob Mayer, Robert Mayer, formed the Reform Group. Uh, much to our consternation, because up to that time we only had one shul. Then, of course, there was the question of how did Chabad start? That started uh, a couple of years later. Venice, Italy, has six uh, or had six synagogues when I was last there. With one rabbi and one uh, and uh, one congregation, Hong Kong today has got uh, one shul with uh, six congregations and about eight rabbis. <laughs> and uh, I remember Lord Kaduri saying at the time, "Don't worry about it. We used to have five synagogues in in Shanghai." Anyway, I was now involved, and uh, I was asked to be by Robert and confirmed by the trustees to be the next chairman of the community. <coughs> I got a call from somebody who would be nameless asking me whether I should accept the chairmanship because Coral wasn't Jewish. I said I hadn't thought about this, but it was a good point, and I phoned up Victor Zaritsky, one of the trustees, and he said, of course you should be the chairman. If the Ohalea Synagogue and the trustees didn't have an open mind in those days, we wouldn't be sitting here tonight. Uh, having gone with uh, Max Shapiro that night to the uh, to the shul and had my my emotional outburst, I asked Rabbi Lapin if I could address the congregation. He said, "Of course you can. You're the chairman." So after the service, I stood up on the bima overlooking the seaside of the shul and said to them, "I'm an empty I'm an empty religious vessel." Rather immodestly, I said, oh, but I'm a strong motivational vessel. If you will start coming to Shul, I will follow you. Well, I started coming to Shul, frankly, only met, and when, as we walked out, Max Shapiro said to me, you know, do you know what you just pledged? I said, that's okay, I can handle it. Thinking, well, I'll go to Shul once a week. So as I walked into Shul every time, one of the Darwish uh, uh, cousins used to stand up, uh, Zuki, Zuki Darwish, and he would follow me sit with me and of course at that time we'd had we had had Birnbaum and Singer. Birnbaum and Singer you didn't get any instruction whatsoever but the art scroll had now been introduced and I learned to um, to stand up and walk back three places. Amazingly I had never noticed all those years of going to shul three times a year I had never noticed Shimona Israel. I never, never noticed the congregation facing west and being very quiet. Uh, so I went to Robert Dorfman and said, have you ever noticed Shimon Ezra? Didn't know what I was talking about. Went to Michael Green, didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> went to uh, Michael Kaduri, didn't know what I was talking about. Basically, uh, the way we were doing things in the Jewish world, we were really helping the reform movement because they were telling everybody exactly what was going on at it. So anyway, um, one day, and you'll notice that I'm sitting here the way I'm sitting. I'm I was sitting in Shul with Zuki Darwish, mm -hmm. where I sit today, more or less. And uh, 
I had my legs crossed. He said to me, Eric, you know, if you were having an audience now with the Queen in England, would you have your legs crossed? I said, I've never thought about it, but I don't think so. He says, you're having an audience. I've never crossed my legs and shoes since. That, that happens to be a safari deal, it's not the general. I've seen rabbis with the legs crossed. Uh, I've stopped a certain friend who's, uh, who's operating the camera over there from crossing his legs, but I haven't stopped it yet. Anyway, so that was the story of the how. Okay, so now I'm going to shul much more often. One day I'll carry my blue bag to a Darwish uh, bris. And David Darwish says to me, Eric, uh, give me your bag. I said, why? He said, I'll send it to your office on Monday. Why? Because you mustn't carry a bag on Shabbat. And so that was how I was trained slowly. You know, it could be pouring with rain, but no umbrella. This is the orthodox way. And so I, I continued to, to listen and to, and to learn. And one day, uh, Rabbi Abner Weiss came to Hong Kong to do a conversion of a Chinese girl. And he said to me, Eric, uh, you are Shoma Shabbat. I said, what's that? He says, you're honoring the Shabbat. And he says, and a coral has been keeping a kosher kitchen for two years. And she had been keeping it for one year, but it was, it was, it was her gesture. And, uh, and coral should convert. Now, coral had tried to convert back in 1967 when she, she fell pregnant. We were sure we were going to have a son, and we were very worried about the bris. The son was, of course, going to be called Nicholas. And, um, and Coral started to go for lessons with the rabbi at the time. Does anybody here remember what the name of the rabbi was back there in the early 70s? Anyway, a young fellow who came here a year or two ago. And, uh, and so she was, used to come home to me and say, look, the rabbi asked me to ask you this question. And I say to her, Coral, I'm Jewish. You know, don't ask me the question. You go back to the rabbi and ask him the question. I was busy trying to make a living, battling. And uh, so she gave up on that, and she got more and more pregnant. And uh, one night, uh, well, actually on Christmas Day, 1967, Nicholas turned out to be Nicole, who's sitting in the front row there. <laughs> so the bris wasn't necessary. And uh, <coughs> Coral kept coming to Shula, and Nicole started coming to Shula as well. And, uh, <coughs> And when she heard that Abner Weiss had said Coral should convert and, and Ben Zion Lapian had been nagging her to, to come for lessons, she went for it. And uh, in, in uh, December, December the 11th of 1992, we were in Los Angeles and she was converted. Uh, and after the conversion, which I sat in uh, the, the lobby of the lounge and listened to what was going on, uh, she the next day went to the mikveh in Los Angeles, and I was allowed to go into the mikveh at, at a certain time. She was there with her gown on and her nails cut and her hair very neatly done, and she got dunked three times, I think. That's where the baptism idea, I suppose, came from. And I was overwhelmed with emotion. I had to get her a book from the mitzvah store on Picker in Los Angeles. So I went in there to get her the book. Oh, one thing I wouldn't do for all this time, and, and Rabbi Benzion was very, very tolerant about I would not lay to fill in. No way was anybody. Everybody in Shul was laying to fill in in the mornings, but I was not laying to fill in. For those of you who are not Jewish and who may not know what to fill in is, that's when we, we wrap the leather thumbs around, box on the head. So I go into this um, mitzvah store, and I buy a corridor of the book, and I, then I say to the fellow, tell me, do you have any to fill in here? He says, yes. I said, well, could you show me some? So he showed me some. This one's $450, this one's $670, and this one's $960. And I'll tell you something, if you pay $960 for Tefillin, you lay them. Life like in the uh, Jewish community for the redevelopment. Well, there was a very small attendance in the synagogue. I remember in the committee we discussed the fact that it was costing, you know, we thought it was too many dollars. And there were about maybe 12 people, 15 people there. Charlotte Godkin was on the committee and she was reporting back on what they spent on uh, Kiddushim at that, uh, that ceremony today. We, we spent a great deal more. Uh, there was not uh, a great interest 
in the, in the synagogue but there's really nothing like it is today and uh, we all met at the, at the recreation club where the two 45 story towers stand today there was a lawn and a, a long barn of a of a club and we came there no kosher food was served in that club it was only after rabbi upson was here that he started the kosher kosher trend which was very much resisted in the beginning they thought it was ridiculous uh, and it was a quiet life but it was very pleasant to set up on the lawn the, the lawn used to get plowed up every Yom Kippur particularly with the cars that parked there and it the rain and many of uh, to try and get your car out there was a lot of unholy swearing going on there <laughs> they were parked all over the lot um, we actually had a chazan at one time uh, a cantor who uh, and Yom Kippur uh, conducted the ceremony and uh, at lunchtime, forgive me, he went down to Lindy's and had a lunch and then came back to the afternoon ceremony. <laughs> um, it was a very, very easy, but thank goodness for the Darwish family. The Darwish family actually, they had a policy, and they still have a policy, that whoever they employed uh, had to be part of the minion. And so they basically were making the shul live. They left us, uh, they got a bit offended because uh, the school was used, the, the shoe was used as a school. The beginning when Carmel School didn't have a place, the shoe was used. And they felt strongly that that shouldn't have happened, so they left the shoe and opened their own congregation. And um, we, uh, I was sort of thinking about that, and so there was very few of us, I mean, the, the, at one time, the shul was being run by <coughs> three or four families, each of whose wives had been converted. The Lieberman family, the uh, Spivak family, the, uh, who was the other one, John? Feuerstein. No, Feuerstein came much later. Okay. So there were just three or four of us, and of course, Benzi and Lup Lupian had come out. Before Benzi and Lupian, we had a rabbi who who wrote letters every week to the congregation, and then at the end of it all, when we didn't know what he was talking about, he, was, he said to be continued, and the same thing went on in the, in the following week. <laughs> but Benzian Lapian was a great bridge builder here, and he really inspired, uh, I believe, Jonathan, he certainly inspired me, and, and uh, Larry Spivak. And we, we became the core of the shul, and we used to sit down, the, the kiddush was in the shul about 25 of us, became 30 of us, became 60 of us, and, and he was the one, and then his, his nephew and uh, son-in-law also was a bridge builder. And, and that was the beginning of building up the marvelous congregation we have today. Simca of 1991, or 1992, there were no children there, no children. Uh, Albert Elfax came with his two two children. Because there were no children there, he took them across to Chabad. Look at it today. You can't even get a parking spot for a pram there today. It's full <laughs> of And uh, what about, were you here during the time when we were in Melbourne Plaza? Yes. The, 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 the uh, club, uh, it was actually the, the character that was here called uh, Carl Weiss. Czechoslovakia. The first time I met Coral was in 1966. I was in hospital at Cap Canossa. And, he, and David Bergen sent him to visit me. He had a half an hour conversation with me. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> uh, anyway, he was the fellow who, who apparently did a lot for the shoe during the Japanese occupation. And he lived to the ripe age of 90, I believe. Um, and he was the one who said to us all, and we thought he was crazy, that we should sell off the property where the, <coughs> where the, the club was and, and have it redeveloped. Eventually, the trustees took that step and they, they did a deal with Hong Kong land. There was a meeting where people were worried whether Hong Kong land would really be able to finance the situation. And I remember David Sutron, who was the chairman at the time, stood up and said, look, if Hong Kong land goes down, then Hong Kong goes down, so don't worry about Hong Kong land. <laughs> a couple of years later, Hong Kong land nearly went down. <laughs> and uh, a deal was done uh, to release them from the agreement. And they paid 10 million to be released, and the, the 
trustees subsequently, especially William McCarter, I think, was leading the, the negotiations for the deal with Swire, the claim, Swire, Swires. Uh, and they, they planned that if they could sell off the apartments at $1,800 a square foot, that would be really a, a good deal and would be viable. Subsequently, the first lot went for 4500 the second lot for 7000 and I think the third lot for over 10000 It was a super profit, and uh, we, we all lived richly ever after. However, whilst the club uh, was being, uh, the JCC was being built, and, and there was a complaint about that because if we were going to be in the basement, we would be like moles. <laughs> so in the Jewish way, we were very, very divided on <coughs> all the plans. We moved down to Queens Road and the Melbourne Plaza. I think it was the fourth or fifth floor of the Melbourne Plaza. I remember that the um, I was chairman at the time. It was also the time that the, the Carmel School was thought of, and, and uh, Ivan, Ivan Greenstein was a leading uh, uh, member because he had helped his father had helped establish the Jewish school system in South Africa. So Ivan was a strength, uh, Rabbi Upton was a strength, and uh, Carmel School was launched at that time. Down at Melbourne Plaza, the uh, yearly uh, cost of running Melbourne Plaza, I seem to remember, was about 1.2 million. It was very popular, it was central, and it was kept very busy. And we all wondered when we moved back up here whether it would work, whether it would be viable, who was going to come up here for lunch. Uh, at the time, I forecast that the cost of running this JCC would be about 12 million. Well, the committee ran the JCC when we eventually moved back here, I think, in the late 90s, and the expense was uh, 20 million. Great, uh, and then the trustees had to pick up this tab. They then brought in professional management, and I believe today the expenses have been the shortfall has fallen to something like uh, $10 million, showing them what, what committees can do uh, in the way of business. <coughs> Eric, uh, my recollection is during the time you were chairman and you were the council that you, you made a point every Saturday of welcoming people into the synagogue. Right. Uh, it's actually been one of the joys of my life. And when I used to walk into synagogue, I felt like a kindergartner. All the matric students were there, and everybody was praying, and nobody was going to break into their uh, prayer to, to greet anybody. Strictly speaking, one shouldn't be diverted from prayer. <coughs> I made a point. Uh, I considered myself the shamus of the shul, of walking around um, and saying hello to people and uh, asking their names and where they were from. I'm afraid that that prayer did suffer because I had to remember the names, or I felt I had to remember the names of everybody, and I remember the guys from Iceland and all over the place. Recently at a wedding in uh, Copenhagen, the uh, Bach Frommel wedding, Fred Cooper was there. And he said he just couldn't believe it, so not neither could his family. When I stood up at the end and I said, you know, we want to welcome Fred Cooper and Ilka and their elder son Ben and Aaron and uh, I've just forgotten the name. Rebecca. And Rebecca. It made a tremendous impact on everybody. So much that the Coral and I were once in a the New York 46th Street kosher restaurant, and the fellow walked over towards us, and I didn't know what he wanted. He made a beeline for me, and he said, you're from Hong Kong? I said, yes. He said, you greeted me in Ohalaya Synagogue once. I'll never forget you. <laughs> uh, on that score, we, we left here in 96 to settle in New York. And we, and the shoe that we were going to go to, I came back to Coral and I said, you know, this is not a friendly shoe. I was there for Shakari's service. Nobody said hello to me. I went over and put my money in the box. The guy who took the money didn't even ask me or welcome me. And I said, we're in trouble. This is not a friendly shoe. So the first Shabbat, I just happened to be early for the service. And everybody was sitting around. So I stood up and said, look, my name is Eric Beer. I'm from Hong Kong. My wife and I have come here. We're here. With, you're a very friendly shoe, and we're delighted to be here. <laughs> Since then, we hear from them regularly. They put a man on the door to greet people. <laughs> and, and, and in Cape Town, I tell you, you wouldn't believe the shoe that we have. It's just unbelievable. So 150 families. And um, 
They greet everybody. There's no furry bills, there's no arguments. It's quite a change. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, <laughs> Eric, uh, you left here when, about five years ago? We left here in 96. Not 10 years. And, uh, meaning, of course, to come back regularly. Yes. Our daughter, Nicole, uh, had got a film degree from New York University. And she phoned me, she lives in Los Angeles, and she phoned me in New York to say, Dad, can I run the business in New York? I said, Nicole, I'd love you to run the business in New York, but what do you know about our business? She said, if I can produce films, I can run the business. And she's done it very successfully in America ever since. It's now her tenth year in the business. Mm -hmm. Eric, uh, you said, uh, I said at the beginning that your, your uh, philosophy was nothing ever happens passively. And you told us about the, the position that you're posting the letters in the coral. What else did you have in mind as far as that was concerned? Well, I'm leaving America as, this, as the uh, nephew of Aaron Beer, which was a bit of a handicap. And, and, and coming over here, leaving South Africa, leaving South Africa rather, and coming over here, after we'd been here about 10 years, every time we went back to South Africa, Aaron Beer, my mentor and really a uh, father to me, uh, would ask me how things were going. And I would say that it's tough, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank is giving me a hard time. And uh, on one trip he said to me, but you're successful. And I said, what do you mean I'm successful? He says, when people say you're successful, you're successful. In any, or anyway, somebody asked me if I'm related to you. <laughs> We've gone full circle. Uh, everything that has happened, I mean, moved to South Africa, which we never intended to go back to. We went back to Cape Town. Uh, things that have happened in my life, uh, in our lives, uh, have turned out as just the worst things, like leaving South Africa. One of the reasons that I had left South Africa and finished with the furniture business is that I was fired. And not only fired, and I was very successful in that business, but they asked me to clear my desk by 2 o'clock that day. The background to it was that I was the highest paid furniture executive in South Africa at 33. And, uh, but I didn't have any hiring rights. I mean, I didn't have any firing rights. I only had hiring rights. And I turned the business around. It hadn't made a, a profit in five years, in three months, rather brashly, and uh, I was in too much of a hurry. In February of 63, I was asked at a board meeting whether, whether, they, whether I agreed that they should hire a consultant. I said, yes, but give them firing rights as well as hiring rights. So they hired the consultant. I never saw hide nor hair of him for six weeks. And then he put in his report saying, you know, the problem is Eric Bear, you should fire him and hire him. <laughs> so that's uh, the irony of it. Eric, you seem over the years to have uh, had a lot of problems. How have you dealt with it? Well, one of the handicaps, thinking back on it, was that I came here from South Africa with South African connections. I didn't have American connections or European connections, and so we battled. The Hong Kong <coughs> Bank was very, very patient with us, and uh, I look back over 42 years with them. Uh, they were very uh, firm and kind in the way they handled us, and time and again I thought we were going to go to the war. Originally, we were named Eric Beer Far East Limited, and I was worried that it was going to, be, it was going to go west. But <laughs> uh, over all the years, and particularly in the 90s, we had a very tough time in business here. Uh, Rabbi Benzi and Lapian said, don't worry, you know, I've been praying every day. I pray for a living. Page, you know, one of the pages of uh, our Siddur, I should know what it is, I think it's 181 F or something. It is a prayer for living, and I prayed every single day, and I still do, uh, that it continues to be good. It turned the corner three or four years ago, and uh, we're now doing amazingly well. And when I look back on it, I think we're very, very fortunate. We have a family and people that work for us. Some of them have been with us over 30 years. We have a family in the Ohalea Synagogue. We have a family in the Orson Max in the Grove in Cape Town. And then we have a fantastic family uh, hanging on the wall at the moment. So definitely everything that happened and anything, anything that ever happens to any one of us uh, is ordained. And it will turn out 
for the best. Any of you that are worried, you take that philosophy of Benzi on Lapia uh, and uh, come to Shul regularly. That helps too. Uh, it will turn out all right. Thank you. Well, on the uplifting notes, uh, thanks very much, Eric. But before we finish, are there any? We've got time for about three, three or four questions. <coughs> I found it very interesting when you said you cried and cried and cried and cried at that point. And I want to ask you, was that the moment, you might say, of your conversion, do you think, that had anything to do with it? I certainly felt that I was <coughs> touched. Mm. And, um, I mean, frankly, I've been going to Shul now for 15 years. I still read most of the service in English. My Hebrew has not advanced as much as it should have. I do get a tremendous pleasure out of going every morning to shul. I feel better. It, I'm not an easy waker-upper. I have to have an alarm to wake me. But if I miss it, I'm the poorer for it. And uh, it was very, it was, oh, it was the most unusual thing in our family. I mean, frankly, uh, not only was I amazed, but a member of our family said to me, and I couldn't argue with him, he said, Eric, anybody in the family, but not you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in South Africa, uh, I joined a shul called the Orsamaic Shul with a charismatic Pied Piper like rabbi called Rabbi Schippel. And one day he said, uh, Eric Beer is your president, just like that. That's how I was elected. And I've been, a, I've been president for six years. My main uh, contribution to the shoe is to keep it afloat from the point of view that we have a Col Negro appeal for 150 families and uh, where other much bigger shoes raise 300,000 Rand. The Rand is today equal to the Hong Kong dollar. Uh, one of them raises 700,000. We raised last year a million. And uh, the other shoes have will be quoted, why don't you do, why don't you support to the appeal like uh, Orsamaic do? So this year they got organized and each of them, each of the ones that weren't performing raised a million. I was very nervous that we wouldn't be able to raise even a million because uh, I had, had talk with people saying that Eric is squeezing us too much. So I, I made a talk which was based on nothing happens haphazardly, <laughs> made the point that if Rabbi Schippel had not come to Cape Town in the American, where would we be? If I had not married Coral, where would I be? And, um, and asked everybody not to fill in their cards until my talk was over. <laughs> and went on, and to my amazement, we raised 1.5. So it's been a very, very successful life so far. I'm 77. And, uh, I feel 17. I had a dream a few years ago that I was trying to find my, put my rugby kit together. I had uh, my, my jock strap on, excuse me. I had my pants on, jersey, and I was looking for my socks. And I said to myself in the dream, are you crazy? You're 70 years old, you can't play rugby, and I woke up. <laughs> I think like a 70 year old. Marvelous. Thank God for good health. I hope uh, for 120 and 30 days. <laughs> Thank you. Still a few more minutes. Anybody else like to? Any questions of Eric? Jonathan? Yes, I have a question. Oh, good. Eric, why did you neglect to mention the many years of dedicated to the United Israel Appeal and all you did to promote Israel, raising funds for Israel? John, I'm si uh, Jonathan, I'm 77. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> the video is rolling, yeah. Eric. Tell us about United Israel Appeal. You used to speak every yeah. Shabbat. You know, yeah. you, you I was. Raise uh, a lot of money for Israel. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. That's one of the reasons I had to leave town, you know. <laughs> I really felt all those years, for 20 years, Michael Green, uh, I followed Walter Sulke. And reading them, the, the passage. Incidentally, last night was the first time I read all the pictures of the passage. I have the book, but I never got to read it. Uh, and it was started the IUA with the UIA here at school. It was started by Morris Birnbaum. I'd forgotten that. And Walter Sulky was the uh, the last chairman before I was appointed in 1976. I served for 20 years and very much helped by Charlotte Godkin. 
And I had the feeling that, of course, was true every time I called anybody, it was about money. And I thought people were crossing the road uh, <laughs> to avoid me. I suppose some of them did. But at the end of it all, I realized that I was respected because I was doing something that other people would uh, not like to do. And I also joined up in, in Cape Town and uh, helping the community in the same way there. It was, a, it was a learning curve. And everything, Jonathan, depends on the ask. Nobody is ever insulted if you say to them, look, what about 25,000? They're not insulted. Sometimes they even give it. And I said the same thing to, to, to uh, Clive tonight. It's in the ask. The questions he asks triggers my memory. I was a Dale Carnegie instructor at 28 in Durban. And um, Dale Carnegie gathered a group together in 1912 in Chicago. Didn't know what to do with him. He said he was going to teach them how to speak and just said to the first person, well, why don't you uh, tell us about yourself? And the rule became in Dale Carnegie that you must talk on something that you're an expert at. So I wasn't nervous this evening because I'm an expert about myself. <laughs> and I must tell you that one night uh, in Cape Town, they brought in six, uh, for 16 nights, they brought in a group, a very mixed group, who would come every night while we instructors got, in, got uh, trained. And the 12 instructors stood at the back of the class, and uh, the, the American uh, instructor, mm -hmm. Stuart McClellan, they would, they would call up one of us to make a comment. The Derek Carnegie system is that you, when somebody makes a talk, you, you go up and you clap and, and you say to him something constructive, something, you know, and, and have him sit down and a compliment. So one of these youngsters, uh, the first night, had to talk on what his name was, just tell his name. It took him 60 seconds and he couldn't get his name out. He was stuttering the whole time. And we were all urging him, you know, hoping he could do it. By the 16th night, he made the closing speech and won the, the pencil, absolute perfect speech. What happened after that, I'm not sure. But on the third night, when we were supposed to talk about something that, that we are expert on, he got up there in the front with a buttered bun in his right hand and started to tell us how the, the universe worked. And uh, he was stumbling through this thing and, and then got stuck, licked his fingers, and we didn't know what was going to happen. And suddenly the instructor said, Eric Beer, let's hear from you. So I had to walk up to the front of the class and I said, Peter, we, we really admired what you did. Uh, when you got butter on your fingers, you didn't hesitate. You picked your fingers and you carried on with your talk very well done. And so <laughs> One other Derek Carnegie story. Uh, they have warm-ups. One of the warm-ups is the Grand Old Duke of York. So on this evening, the ladies were sitting back. The front chairs were empty. I had all the ladies come up forward or sitting down here. And I said, I'm going to now demonstrate to you the Grand Old Duke of York. So I said, okay. The Grand Old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill. He marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. Morris Price sitting in the back of the room puts his hand up. I thought, the guy wants to go to the toilet. I said, yes, Morris. He says, can I talk to you? He said, yes. So he comes up to me. I drive to him. He says, Eric. Your flies open. <laughs> so I stood up and I said, this course teaches you confidence. Anyway, <laughs> believe me, Dale Carnegie did me a lot of good. I think we can do one more question to Errol. Can I just ask, um, of Eric, given that you spent half the time in South Africa and half the time over here, um, just your thoughts on the future of South Africa, specifically with respect to the Jewish um, population? and where you see it going in the future, specifically after 2010. Errol, one of the problems uh, in all these years that we've been away is the people who leave South Africa and, uh, and bad mouth it. In all the years, uh, it's only, I can never again become a South African citizen. Because when I went before the board here in Lower Albert Road to get a conversion to a British passport or a Hong Kong British passport, because we couldn't go to Manila, we couldn't go to uh, uh, Malaysia, we yeah. couldn't go to, uh, Japan was difficult, but we could go, we couldn't go to Indonesia. So they grilled me there, the Brits and two Chinese were on the, the board as well, about why did I want to become British? And uh, I don't know, 
just Dafka. I said, uh, look, I want to come become British, but of course I, I can't travel in the area. And so they kept questioning, what about the British heritage and what about this? And I said, look, you remind me, I can't believe I did this, but I did, of the Jew uh, who was walking past, the converted Jew was walking past the synagogue with his, his friend the hunchback, and he said to the hunchback, you know, I used to be a Jew. And the hunchback said, yes, I know, I used to be a hunchback. <laughs> When I came in, I said I would always be a South African. And when I came and told Coral this, I said I blew it. Uh, I was surprised that, uh, that I actually got the, con the conversion. And I went to a meeting somewhere where a whole lot of people were going to be uh, converted. And uh, somebody walked up to a nun standing next to me she, and said to her, are you Eric Bear? Uh, anyway, what happened was that I got the conversion, but I had to swear or affirm, because I wouldn't swear, Bible, I had to affirm that I would never again become a South African citizen. It's a unique case. I asked Gerald Godfrey about it. He says he's never heard of it before. But that's the problem. Anyway, as far as South Africa is concerned, and your question, you know there's a South African Jewish Board of Deputies. It's like the Parliament of the Jews in South Africa. And it's very close to the government, and they've had meetings, had meetings with uh, <coughs> Becky. Becky came to one of the meetings that I was at as well and assured us that, uh, that we have a future there. And they're doing very well. Business is very good. Uh, immigration has slowed down to a trickle now. The rabbis are telling everybody that either go home, meaning Israel, or stay home. And we believe that apart from the threat of uh, crime, there's a 45%, as you know, unemployment problem there. And the crime is very, very serious now. And the report's coming out about it, uh, very disheartening, but I don't believe that we're going to have uh, the same problems as before. We lost the cream of Jewry. There were 120,000 Jews in South Africa, and now there are only 60,000. Australia scored, Canada scored, and the rest of the world scored. And wherever Jews have gone, South African Jews, they have made a, an impact. Was a very strong work ethic. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, ladies and thank you for the team.